Uh, hello and welcome to Deep Macro's Future of Finance podcast. I'm Jeff Young, the CEO of Deep Macro. Today, our guest is Yasu Ota, who is a senior writer at the Nikkei newspaper in Tokyo. He recently published a book, not out in English yet, uh, but I'm going to translate the title as Semiconductor Geopolitics Toward the Year 2030. Who's going to control the strategic goods? I don't know if that's about right, but that's my, my attempt. Right. Um, it has been very well received. Uh, and we hope that an English translation is coming soon, because I think it really fills a gap uh, with perspectives from across Asia, which we tend not to hear enough of here in the United States. And I'm also joined as co-host today uh, of this podcast by Thomas Hu. Uh, Thomas is the founder and CEO of Kyber Capital in Taipei, which is a venture capital company focused on fintech and blockchain. He brought this excellent book to my attention, and therefore he's going to be the co-host today. So anyway, um, welcome both Otosan and Thomas. Um, let me start right in. Um, so in your book about the geopolitics of semiconductors, uh, you've shown us a very complex and interdependent world, uh, technology, commerce, politics. Can you walk us through the strategic advantages and vulnerabilities of the major players? Um, and how you think each of them are trying to um, advance their core interests. Well, thank you, Jeff. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, the things are moving so fast. And actually, uh, right after this meeting, so I have an uh, appointment with the people of semiconductor industry here because there's a huge exhibition and the conference is taking place in, in Tokyo. And all the VIP came to Tokyo and discuss what will happen, what is uh, the what kind of strategy they should take, uh, including government. As you said, uh, the players are quite a lot. I mean, the governments uh, and the companies and the individuals. Actually, when you we look at the semiconductor industry, I think we have to think in the, on the three layers. One is state, namely the governments or nations. The second was corporations, uh, private sectors. Uh, then third is the individuals, I mean, mainly uh, engineers. So we tend to look at the, the structure and, and the interrelations between the, among the government only, but we have to take a look at the company's behavior and even more important is individuals, how they move and what the, their interests are. Uh, so, well, asking, answering your question. So uh, the structure of the, the complex supply chain is, yes, it is very complex. And the players in the U.S., one, the U.S. government, Biden administration and Trump administration before, are uh, interested in containing China and they would do as much as they can, right? Uh, they announced uh, the new uh, export ban on October 7th. And actually the, yesterday in the US time, right? On the, yes, no, today. And yesterday in Tokyo time, uh, they added more restriction to China. So, so they, it seems to me, they, are, they do everything what they can do, the US government. So that's one thing. So the big question is how the the U.S. move uh, moves are uh, taken by the the Asian countries, including Japan, Taiwan, Korea. That's one thing we have to look at that uh, layer. The second one's the players of uh, industries, and for example, TSMC has a great advantage in this game uh, because they have technology. It's only TSMC has a technology, and they became a a choke point of uh, the supply chain. And the same, by the same token, the ASML in, in Netherlands have the same position in the supply chain. So, so all the players, including government and industries and uh, individual, depends on the, those two, mainly two companies, only two. Uh, so at this moment, so the, the game seems to be played that, that it's, the people tend to look at the game and play it by the nations only. But if you look from the position of TSMC, for example, you might have a different scene. So, so what I was trying to do in my book is uh, 
to look at the, the world and international politics uh, through the prism of the semiconductors. This expression is Jeff likes, right? <laughs> so that, that is my uh, um, understanding of the situation today, and it is changing so rapidly. Thomas, you want to take it away? <laughs> yes, I, I think uh, oda uh, as you mentioned, that there are so many layers uh, uh, of uh, observations uh, that we, we should adopt in understanding this very complex web. I, I just wanted to understand, say, uh, you've been stationed in Washington, D.C. for many years, and then from the U.S. side, uh, clearly we have heard and seen uh, almost like a bipartisan consensus that uh, if the United States would like to maintain technology supremacy, then containing men in China is a necessity. Now, uh, and that brings to the question of industry policy. Um, do you think that given where it is today, uh, given the domestic political situation of the United States and the fact that the world is a very complex and interdependent uh, post-COVID, post-globalization, a situation, if you will. Mm -hmm. Do you think what the U.S. is trying to do can actually be done? You know, how how do you how do you score that effort at this point? Right. Um, the the policies the U.S. government is taking is is the industrial policy, right? So, um, well, now the the world and the nations in the world are moving forward, moving from moving. Uh, apart from the the era of uh, the globalization, so we are no longer in the the age of globalization. But I don't think the globalization will die soon. But uh, as a notion or concept of globalization, globalism is ending. So you cannot uh, stop the globalization because you cannot stop the move of the companies. But uh, the the global as as a globalism is is dead. So that means that the nations and the governments has to go for that direction. So I, I guess in Washington, even in Tokyo, nobody talks about the globalization anymore. But instead, they talk about the industrial policy. You know, the Japan is regarded has been regarded as a the country of industrial policy for a long time. So that is uh, the Japanese government's strategy to win uh, in the competition with the US and other uh, developed nations. But the, that uh, observation is wrong. Uh, like, like 20 years ago, or around the year of 2000, the, the world of, of the uh, industrial policy is dead here. So it became more like a taboo words because of the globalization. Globalization means uh, uh, competition, fair competition in the market and free trade, right? So uh, free trade was a keyword, is a keyword. And the market is market competition is the most important value. So the, the for example, the Ministry of Economy, uh, uh, trade and the industry, Metis, uh, was, it used to be a very strong, powerful, the, uh, the government branch until year 2000, around 2000. Now, after that, they became quite quiet because they cannot wield their uh, strongest arm, the industry policy. So they, they basically, they have nothing that they can do in, on the industry. So they've been quiet, but now the time of semiconductor war. So they became, they revived. And they're so talking with the people in the METI. So I feel that they are so different. The same people. Yeah, same I bureaucrat. think I think they have a bounce in their step. I think you're quite right. I'm going to say ask the same question. But can the U.S. do that? Uh, we don't have much of a history of industrial policy. I mean, given your experience, um, do you think that the goals of the CHIPS Act uh, that the was passed with bipartisan support, um, are we going to be able to do industrial policy that you say even Japan was kind of moving away from because it had a mixed record? Yeah, well, China is a keyword. 
Hmm. The only reason why the U.S. can adopt the industrial policy is China. As long as China is there as a competitor or rivals uh, in terms of the industry and the national securities, so you can justify legit legitimacy there in the U.S. side. So when it comes to the policy toward against China, is it's quite, uh, it's not politicians, so Republican and Democrats all agree on the China policy, right? Basically, there's a consensus in Washington. So well, I don't really think the U.S. government likes. And the people likes like the the industry po policy idea, but they have to because it was China. So if China is not there, or the in the future China becomes a friend, for example, of the U.S., so industry policy will disappear immediately. So that's big difference between the U.S. and Japan. Uh, Japan is it's uh, it's more sh kind of shallower than that uh, than the what they they're doing in the U.S. Um, the U.S. is is fighting against China, so they had to they have to take their industrial policy. But in Japanese side, it's it's more like a, how to say uh, the preference of of the of the government, how uh, strong they can uh, uh, will use their power on the industry and the people, but but national security. I don't think that they are shared by the many uh, people, the most of the people in Japan, is they are not so sensitive on this issue, but not in the US. Everybody so, was worrying about China, right? So I, I think that is a big difference. So the, my short answer is as long as China is there, the US being US government can adopt the industry industry policies. Just follow up on that then. Can China become independent? Uh, I think that the perception in the US is that, you know, if we, you know, implement the export ban, we keep the engineers from working, uh, lean on ASML. Um, China's uh, not at the stage of development where they can actually move forward. Uh, do you agree with that? Or is that sort of um arrogant on our part to believe that china really doesn't have domestic development capabilities right if you ask the the people in the industry or the policy makers in washington or kasumi gaseki in tokyo they say uh, the gap between the u.s technology well allied nations technology including taiwan and china is is like five years or even 10 years but i don't really think so we shouldn't underestimate the speed of China. Uh, it might take only two, three years, that kind of range. I I stationed in, in Singapore uh, for, until five years ago before COVID-19 started. And I often travel to, to China, uh, mostly in Shenzhen, uh, which is uh, the, the capital of the high-tech industry. And every year or even every six months, they change uh, the scene of the city towns changes so rapidly like uh, like two years ago there was no quite a few uh electronic EV, ev is is running around the city but nowadays almost 100 percent of the cars are running on the streets are evs uh, because of the government subsidiary and other tax uh, advantages they can take but the speed is so high so people call it calls it the um, uh, Shenzhen speed, which is uh, 10 times or even 100 times higher uh, than, than the, the speed in, in Tokyo or in, 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 the, in California. So that we shouldn't underestimate of their capability, not the level of the industry the technology, but the capability of the catching up to the US, even though the, the technology flow from the US and Taiwan and Korea is restricted, they would do, they would manage it to get the technology somewhat. So that's why I said that we have to take a look at the, the move of the, the individuals, for example. Technology transfer is not automatic. They move, technology move with the people. So the, for the individuals, uh, the question is how, where and how they want to work. And if you go to Shenzhen, for example, you will see many Americans and Japanese engineers. You know, they are quietly <laughs> moved from the U.S. or California or, or Tokyo 
to find the better job, high uh, salary. So they, they want to do whatever they want. I mean, they are not interested in the politics, basically. So that's government's interest, but their interest is to do meaningful uh, things to the society using their uh, brain. So that's one thing we have to take a like, So uh, in, in, in a short word, uh, China is catching up soon. And uh, containing China is not easy. And the other part we have to uh, consider well is uh, we tend to look at only the high tech, uh, uh, high tech uh, in uh, technology like uh, two nanos, three nanos, uh, below ten nanos technology. But it, it's just a tiny portion of the whole semiconductors, but measure the volume zone in some semiconductor here, the middle range. This is exact with industry, lacks of in industry, auto industry and everything. So this part is important. And after the the Trump and the Biden administration impose a sanction to the Chinese companies, yes, the flow of the, the high tech uh, semiconductors has uh, just stopped. For example, the Taiwan export to China is basically stopped in the top top layer of the, the technology. But looking at middle part, I, I checked the, the trade statistic recently. Uh, it's increasing actually between the US and China. So, well, even though the US government and other governments think that they can contain the China uh, of uh, in terms of the technology flow, it's only about the tiny portion. And, and in the main market, trade free trade trade is intact. So the short answer is uh, yes and no. Uh, you can stop the flow of high tech, but no in in uh, most of the technologies. Well, Taiwan is obviously a very uh, important, if not the most critical geopolitical hotspot, this uh, semiconductor trade war, if you will, between the United States and China. In your books, you uh, talked about TSMC uh, in great details, especially uh, uh, their collaboration with partners in Japan with regards to some other advanced technologies they're exploring. Now, do you think that now after this uh, 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 long trade war, uh, uh, the TSMC will be able to evolve into a stronger company, you know, or it, it might uh, fall uh, as other uh, Japanese tech giants before, which fell under the heavy influence of the United States government. Yeah, well, yesterday and today in the US actually, uh, the Biden administration announced a new um, trade ban to China, which includes uh, YMTC, a Chinese, um, some major chip maker, and SMIC, CINIC, uh, Chinese only and the biggest uh, foundries. And uh, this works, but uh, this major was regarded as the, well, actually Japanese semiconductor companies, uh, companies don't, don't like it. Uh, the, they don't want to just uh, follow the U.S. Uh, they have to follow the U.S. because the U.S. is is powerful in um, in because of three reasons. One is the size of the market uh, because the U.S. Uh, market is so big. They have to you know have to keep the good relation with the, with the U.S. and and the U they, they need to keep the access to the U.S. market. And probably they have even have to move to the to Arizona. The second one is is uh, is a restriction of the government. Um, they have to abide by the the rules the U.S. imposed. Um, the third is the force. They are afraid of of the U.S. government. Um, I don't really think if TSMC or Japanese company want to move to to U.S. with the same token to China as well. And being sandwiched by two nations, so but they, they have a freedom to choose one or two, and they don't want to choose. And so, uh, I, I think it depends on the, the each companies. And uh, well, I'm 
I don't know. This is a, this can be the answer to your question. Like when we last week, the the new company is formed in in Tokyo, which is called Rapidus, and it's, which is backed by the Japanese government. And then, as you know, they have the the, the sponsors are uh, uh, includes uh, Toyota and Denso. Uh, it's a subsidiary of Toyota as well, and uh, uh, Sony. NTT and NEC and uh, SoftBank. I don't know why SoftBank is included and a UFJ a bank. <laughs> so um, they have a huge amount of money from the government. And next year, probably our uh, Japanese government will, at uh, the Japanese Congress will admit, uh, pass the, uh, the, the, the bill of the huge uh, budget for next year uh, for this company with the reason of national security. So they have money and a company was formed. So they're trying to catch up with the US beyond two nanos. So the, the, if you were in the shoes of the management of the, of the Rapidus company, um, you just go for the US. What they're trying to do is independent, you know, and independent of the Taiwan of the US. I, I don't think at this, they will be successful as they planned, but at least there's a trial. And behind this trial movement, there's a slight sense of uh, nationalism based on the experience of uh, 90s, 80s with the US. Uh, there was a US-Japan semiconductor agreement, you know, and it is regarded as an unfair agreement, uh, which I personally agree with that opinion. So well, they feel like they are defeated by the the U.S. the U.S. with the the political power. So the people in the industry want to make sort of sort of revenge, probably. <laughs> and uh, the actually the generation of the fifties and sixties, over sixties, are quite energetic in in the course of uh, establishing of of this company. So that's well, one thing we have to take a look at. Yeah. Can I can I break in there because uh, again I think from the Washington perspective um, there's a lot of talk about friend shoring and a quote unquote almost an alliance um, you know involving Taiwan Japan South Korea you know who knows who else uh, as if they will just simply follow but um, it sounds as if you're saying that's unrealistic um, the different governments may have different interests and the different companies. Uh, not to mention, at the very end, you mentioned the people in their 50s and 60s who have that experience. Uh, so is the U.S. policy based on a dramatic misunderstanding of the regional interests? Or um, is it something that will all cooperate to a certain level? Because the the whole idea of friendshoring as the substitute for globalization um, is pretty powerful. earthquake here oh yeah it's it looks safe. like something's moving <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> we're in a safe place anymore yeah wow. well <laughs> well the u.s policy is not liked by the allied nation including japan and taiwan because it um uh, it uh, restrained the, the freedom of the the the, the choice of the, the company can take but even though they don't like it, they have to listen to the U.S. Uh, with a reason uh, uh, which I mentioned before. Um, so constraints of the freedom of the, the, of the management of the companies, as well as the, the constraints of the freedom of the, the occupational choice for individuals, right? So isn't this a human right, human right issues? <laughs> But this may be the, the extreme uh, views. But when people in US and Japan talks about the Chinese uh, human right uh, issues, uh, if you look at from the Taiwan side or Japanese side, somewhat the, the people are restrained by the government. So uh, the, in the general uh, public opinion is not necessarily they like the US policy. So this certainly affect I'll make influence to Japanese government policy. That, that's one thing I can say. 
Do you think that there yeah, will be so, more? So, and also, we have to take a look at the each uh, member states of ASEAN, right? So, so as Thomas mentioned before, there was a huge and long and complex supply chain, mainly in Asia. And Japan and Taiwan and Korea cannot complete the supply chain, even with the US and the uh, Netherlands. We need to have a Malaysia and a Singapore. And uh, what they're trying to do is they listen to the US but they are not necessarily just for the US. Well, even in the sanction against Russia, they say, okay, we'll go with you. You know, so we are allied with the US, but looking at what exactly what they're doing, doing right, is, is not necessarily fully uh, you know, banned exports. They somewhat, uh, there's a loophole actually. So the export from the ASEAN nation to Russia is not, has not stopped. So the, the things are moving. So this shows, you know, their uh, attitude and behavior. When uh, Kamala Harris went to uh, the ASEAN nation saying uh, uh, the U ASEAN is friend of the U.S. and do we share the same uh, uh, values? And, and the people in the ASEAN listen to them and say, yes, yes, that's exactly what you're doing. We agree with you. But in, in, in reality, uh, they listen to the China and they say the same, they give the same smile to China. So uh, this is a reality of Asia. So they just don't look at the Asia from the perspective of the US only. So from the ASEAN nation, from Korea, from Japan. So then you're gonna have different scenes. Yeah, you mentioned a lot of these small and middle powers uh, in uh, Indo-Pacific region, right? In the superpower competitions and Lupo is a key word, you know, uh, I, I was reminded of the history of the Liao Takasaki memorandum back in the Cold War eras when the, there was supposed to be a very cleanly delineated uh, trade barriers uh, between the free world and the so-called communist world. And yet Japan was able to uh, sign that deal with the PRC and to, to, to effectuate certain trade relationships. Now, now that fast forward now today, then we have RCEP, we have CPTPP, and then we have Quad uh, or Chip Alliance. Uh, all, all that NATO-like uh, organizations are popping up. What do you think uh, uh, all these small and middle powers will do? And, and in particular, in your view, would Japan be able to play a more critical, if not a central role in facilitating some of the uh, inhibited trade flows and, and discussions and communications going forward. The, the difference between NATO and uh, semiconductor alliance, if you can call it that way, is that you cannot move the, 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 the country um, you know, geographically, you cannot move physically the company, a country from here and there. So U.S. is there and Germany is there and then you can draw the line of NATO. So it, it is possible to, to divide the two realms uh, into two parts, NATO or anti-NATO. But when it comes to a semiconductor, supply chain is so complex and global. You cannot change this global supply chain. You need uh, China for example, to complete this supply chain, uh, as long as they have uh, uh, the other later proce uh, process of the, the money uh, fabrication, I don't know how it's called in English, uh, hacking, testing, the chopping. Um, they look at the, the how the one chip is, is produced. It's uh, on the top of the flow, there's, uh, for example, ARM at the British company, they have the IPs, basic IPs. And most of the chip maker have to follow that IP structure, ARM structure. So that's origin, for example. And it comes to the the, the companies like uh, Apple, uh, uh, Qualcomm, all those people design the chips, right? So uh, and the chips is manufactured um, manufactured in, in the Taiwan and Korea, but for TMC. TSMC and the Samsung, they, where they procure their materials is from Japan and Malaysia and Indonesia. And also to Sony, for example, it makes a small, tiny air uh, sensors uh, and the camera sensors. They 
produce the chips for sensors in Kumamoto, but it's one layer. And the second part, they have to produce a logic part of the semiconductor. And they have to uh, combine and to make one uh, uh, components. And this one is manufactured in, in Taiwan. And this module is, uh, is, is made in Korea. So things moves from uh, Kumamoto to Taiwan, Taiwan to Korea. And eventually it was chopped and attacked in China. So the things are moving around and, and the iPhone itself is produced in China, made in China. And the things, uh, many materials and components uh, and, and the parts is gathered into China. So while we are, uh, we relied on China, China as a location of manufacturing. So even though the, the, the export ban is successful against China, so it's not easy, easy to move the factory from China to somewhere else. Uh, it must be costly and it is, takes time. So, so uh, that might be the, the challenge we have to, to look, look at. Uh, this might be your conscious con answer to your question, but, but I don't know. That, would, you, would you elaborate that question a bit? Well, I have one question that's kind of a follow-up. Um, I've been kind of surprised that China has not responded strongly uh, to the export ban, uh, the restrictions on personnel. Um, mm. Why is that? Uh, it seems like there just hasn't been much of a response. Um, could you speculate on the reasons for that? Or maybe there's more going on behind the scenes that I'm, I'm not aware of. Well, they're, they're, first of all, they are confident. You know, it's just a matter of time. And the sense of time is different in China. We say five, three, five years is just a short time. But for them, it's 10 years or even 100 years is a short time. So uh, they are looking in the longer term uh, on this issue. That's one thing. So within 10 years, uh, this is high possibility for China to catch up and uh, to, to make the same level of technology. And also, they have allies nation, allied nation as well. Uh, Russia, for example, Russia doesn't like China. China doesn't like Russia, but uh, Russia doesn't like the U.S. and China doesn't like the U.S. So enemies, enemies, friend. So the tie between the Russia and China will be uh, stronger, I guess. Even though uh, China is much, uh, uh, China has a uh, the stronger position than than Russia. Because Russia cannot produce semiconductors, only uh, only uh, foundries they can use is is uh, Chinese uh, foundry, which is SCMIC, because uh, as import from Taiwan is limited; it's almost banned. It's, so the, the, they have allied on different uh, behind the 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 scene. There's a the complex and a huge network of supply chain of semiconductors, which is not quite visible from our side that's one thing we have to take a look you know the the saudi arabia or the other the nations in the middle asia uh middle part of asian uh eurasian so uh, they have a strong tie with china and malaysia for example uh, they are quiet in this war uh but because they are looking at the relation with russia and china so uh, uh i i don't think uh, uh they're and also, we, 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 uh, for me, the, the meeting of uh, Biden, Mr. Biden, President Biden, and the Xi Jinping, which took place in October, November in Bali, they, they didn't talk much about semiconductor. But did you, did you look at the facial expression of Xi Jinping after the meeting? He was smiling. And so obviously, they talked a lot about the bilateral relations, which is about Taiwan. The U.S. doesn't wouldn't invade or make that uh, military attack on on Taiwan unless they had to. So that means it's a U American choice to do something. So even though they are making a lot of exercise and uh, you know military. Uh, 
activity around Taiwan nation, they wouldn't, I don't think they can touch on Taiwan because if they touch on in Taiwan physically, that that trigger the Chinese move. So this is a quite delicate balance between the US and China. And obviously they are talking. So as long as they have such a talk and the US doesn't touch the Taiwan, basically the Taiwan policy on the US, but semiconductor issue is not the major product of Xi Jinping administration because they are confident and uh, somewhat they can get the technology from the West. So, um, so the, that that is my observation. So, the, so we have to we we have to aware of the dialogue between the two major nations, which is not quite visible to the other people and investors. Okay. You've compared the uh, semiconductor chips to the crude oil of the 21st century. Now, that brings us to the point of stagflation. Uh, as we all know, back in the 1970s, there was this series of oil crises, which was part of a, a superpower competition anyway. So do you feel that uh, the world is well prepared uh, for potentially stagflation coming back uh, as in part due to the supply chain uh, trade war issues and perhaps semiconductor uh, war, chip war is really but a theater in this uh, mm. multi-dimensional great game. Mm. Yes, um, and the trade uh, chip war has started and uh, whether like or not TSMC and Samsung must go to Arizona and New Mexico or Texas, wherever. Uh, but they don't necessarily like that. Um, they have to do it, but uh, they don't like it because the cost of, uh, of the manufacture uh, industry in, in the US is obviously higher than Asia, uh, probably twice higher or even three times higher. So it's not logical for them to to make things on, on the U.S. soil. Um, so the the now oh, they have to go to the U.S. and they have to follow the U.S. policy. But if the the political environment changes just a little bit, their uh, behavior, their judgment will will be different one. So they, it must be quite quick. Well. TM, TSMC, for example, make a huge investment on the Arizona, but at the same time, they have a factory around the Nanjing or the other part of China, and they want to keep it. The reason for that is they cannot escape. That's one thing, of course, but uh, from TSMC, has, they want to keep the relation with Chinese government. Um, so the, the trade war and Cold War, maybe, uh, I mean, the Cold War, uh, we are facing right now is different shape, uh, different from the, the we experienced in, in, in the 70s and uh, the 40s. So it's different from World War II. So the semiconductor is different from the oil. The oil, oil production is concentrated in one place and they can dominate whole the supply chain, but semiconductors, no. Even though you can grip the, the high technology, but it's not whole uh, technical uh, semiconductor as well. So uh, it's quite difficult to make a cold war uh, structure of the world, of, of the, the world, not right now, yeah. Okay, Jeff, well, Otosan, thank you very, oh, yeah. We're kind of coming up to our time. Um, so Otosan, I just okay. wanted to thank you very we much for, <laughs> yeah, for, uh, thank you very much for participating. Um, and uh, uh, we look forward to the publication of your book in English. Well, I don't know. If the, the, no U.S. publisher comes to me, uh, but it was published in in Chinese. I think Thomas know of it. Did. Yeah. And the Korean, and it is uh, selling well. This one is a book of mine. 
<laughs> that's the Japanese version. Yeah. yeah that's <laughs> Excellent. The content is for informational purposes only. You should not construe any such information or other material as legal, tax, investment, financial, or other advice. Nothing contained in this material constitutes a solicitation, recommendation, endorsement, or offer by Deep Macro Incorporated or any third party service provider to buy or sell any securities or other financial instruments in this or in, in any other jurisdiction in which such solicitation or offer would be unlawful under the securities laws of such jurisdiction. All content is information of a general nature and does not address the circumstances of any particular individual or entity. None of the information constitutes professional and or financial advice, nor does any of the information constitute a comprehensive or complete statement of the matters discussed or the law relating thereto. There are risks associated with investing loss of principal as possible. Some high risk investment may use leverage, which will accentuate gains and losses as securities or firms past investment performance is not a guarantee or predictor of future investment performance.